Not everyone can appear in the public eye and suddenly become a star. My advice, for what it's worth, get a billboard. No, usually it takes plenty of hard work, a little bit of talent, the right amount of luck and help and support from those in positions of influence. And the same is true when it comes to WWE. Hell, Vince McMahon could have made Reno Riggins world champion and WrestleMania main eventer if he so desired, but his role was as a designated jobber. It's a role that many have occupied through throughout WWE history, and while it can be tough to outgrow it, many jobbers can and do go on to become stars. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE wrestlers who went from jobbers to stars. Join us. Number 10, 123 Kid. Though immensely talented, Sean Waltman was vastly undersized when it came to mainstream North American wrestling during the era he broke in. The High Flyer was something of a trailblazer in the early part of his career, thrilling audiences on the independent circuit and in Japan with his cutting-edge, high-octane style. He earned himself a WWE tryout, which led to a contract, if not instant stardom. From the beginning, the Kamikaze Kid was primarily used to put others over, including in his brief debut match against Doink the Clown. The name changed from Kamikaze to Cannonball, though it didn't change his fortunes much as he quickly lost yet again to Mr. Hughes. The next week on Raw, however, now simply going as the kid, he managed to score the upset of a lifetime when he famously pinned Razor Ramon after a moonsault. A star-making performance and result, the match with Razor turned Waltman into a genuine star and he began to receive a decent push that saw him win more matches than he lost. From then on, size didn't matter when it came to the future X-Pac. Number 9, Daniel Bryan. Once upon a time, young Daniel Bryan was signed to a WWE developmental deal, plugging away in Memphis in the hope that his big break would one day come. It didn't, though, as the American Dragon was let go before making it to TV proper, despite doing some extra work and wrestling in the requisite dark matches. He didn't sit around and cry about what could have been, however, instead grafting hard to become one of the premier independent talents of his generation, with standout work in groups like Ring of Honor and overseas in New Japan. How peculiar then that the GOAT showed up for a few velocity bouts just as his international reputation was really starting to grow. D. Bry did the favours for Jamie Noble, John Cena and the team of Paul London and Brian Kendrick on separate shows, though he got to avoid looking like a total jabroni in defeat. He didn't sign a contract with WWE, however, opting instead to stay the course for the preceding six or so years. When Brian did return, it was as the long shot contest on NXT The Game Show Series 1, and he proved all the bastards wrong. Number 8, Barry Horowitz. Back when the squash match was king, WWE needed plenty of enhancement talents on the book in order to work the marathon TV tapings that saw multiple shows being recorded in one sitting. Veteran journeyman Barry Horowitz was a great choice for the gig, since he had ample experience and a little bit of name value, meaning that whoever beat him would get more of a rub than if they got a win over Joe Schmo or some other generic punching bag. Horowitz rarely, if ever, won a match, but he was allowed to look competitive and garnered some something of a cult following with viewers. This resulted in Big Baz getting a shocking win against Body Donna Skip in his first proper victory over an established WWE star. That in turn led to a mini feud and subsequent push for Horowitz as he got more surprise wins over the likes of Hakushi and found himself booked on major pay-per-views like SummerSlam and Survivor Series in featured matches. It was a dizzying few months, but inevitably it couldn't last and it wasn't too long later that Horowitz found himself back on a long losing streak before being released. Number 7, Just Incredible. There was nothing incredible about PJ Polacco's early WWE days, though I'm sure the rookie was just thankful to have a job with a major organization back then. And job is the operative word here, because that's what Polacco, as PJ Walker, spent most of his time doing. The future ECW champion stared at the ceiling for everyone from Yokozuna and The Undertaker to Ludwig Borger and Lex Luger in the early to mid 90s on shows like Raw, Superstars, and Wrestling Challenge. His career picked up 
when he was signed to a full-time contract and became Aldo Montoya, the Portuguese Man o' War. No, not an actual battle veteran or anything like that. A Portuguese Man o' War. You know, the jellyfish. Though he looked like he had a yellow jockstrap slapped onto his face, it was still a step up and he became, if not a star, then certainly a more featured part of the show. PJ would become an even bigger deal when he left WWE in favour of Philadelphia and returned to WWE after the death of ECW as a star in his own right. Number 6. Mick Foley Mick Foley is as unlikely a superstar as you're ever going to come across. The man is a legend ten times over, of course, but his look, wrestling style, and character were all far from what was courted by the mainstream. Long before he was being thrown off the cell or playing with sock puppets, Foley was getting tossed around those rock-hard WWE rings in the mid-80s as an ordinary job guy. Foley, who got the gig thanks to his connection with his trainer and former WWE star Dominic DiNucci, suffered a rude awakening when he met the British Bulldogs in his first WWE outing, receiving a broken jaw courtesy of a particularly unhappy Dynamite Kid. Matches against the Killer Bees, Kamala and Hercules went smoother for Jack Foley, but he never looked like getting signed. And nor should he have, since he was green and unremarkable at the time. Foley spent the next decade making his reputation in WCW, ECW and Japan, and when he put pen to paper with WWE proper in 96, he did so as a polished performer ready for prime time. Number 5. James Ellsworth the jobber, or in WWE speak, local competitor, made a bit of a comeback in the 2010s, first as bait for the insurgent Ryback and then as fuel for the Braun Strowman choo-choo train. Because remember, he was a choo-choo train, folks. They had a sound effect and everything. Feels like a lifetime ago. Anyway, this proved that the formula of big guys destroying no-name little guys week after week is one that works for a reason. It also gave life to the phenomenon of James Ellsworth, the pasty-skinned, no-chinned chancer who set social media alight with his odd appearance and pre-match promo declaring that anyone with two hands has a fighting chance. Incredibly, WWE latched onto the buzz and booked Ellsworth for future appearances, putting him into the storyline between Dean Ambrose and W. WWE Champion AJ Styles. One shot turned into two, which somehow turned into a one-year run with the company, where he was always featured in some sort of storyline, whether fighting for the WWE title or managing Carmella. And now I hear that Ellsworth is able to charge double his old fee on the indies these days, based on his WWE notoriety. That's right, 70 bucks. Number 4. Dean Ambrose it might surprise you to find out that the man now going by John Moxley wasn't always a surly, old-at-heart barroom brawler type that smokes cigarettes instead of stretching and celebrates wins by knocking back shots of gasoline. He was once a fresh-faced rookie, hoping to turn heads, which may explain the candy-floss pink hair he was sporting when he showed up for WWE job duty in the mid-2000s. The Lunatic Fringe first appeared to put over then-tag team champions Eminem in a match taped for Velocity, before coming back a few months later to lose a handicap match to Big Show on Sunday Night Heat. His partner on that night? Well, a lad going by the name Rick Dick, now known as LA Knight. Ambrose had one more job left in him and returned many months later to do the honours for Val Venus in another match taped for Heat. Hey, you know what? I reckon Val Venus should have teamed up with Rick Dick because they could have... <laughs> well, never mind. And that was it for Ambrose in WWE for a few years, before he signed a developmental deal and eventually debuted with a couple of other fellas who turned out to be pretty alright too, I guess. Number 3. Bobby Roode being the son of WWE Hall of Famer Rick Rude, you would think that Bobby Rude would have a golden ticket when it came to- Hold the fort! You're telling me that Bobby Rude didn't come from the swiveling hips and pulsating groin of the ravishing one? Well, I'll be. Regardless, Bobby Rude had a lot of the tools that WWE looks for in prospects and had at least been on their radar since 2001, which is when he first showed up to take a pasting. That first time was an episode of Jacked, going by the name Rudy Rude, and his opponent 
opponent was the always mellow Perry Saturn. The glorious one would continue to be paid for being pinned on WWE TV on and off for the next three years. He wrestled the likes of Albert, the FBI, Three Minute Warning, Billy Kidman, Sean O'Hare, and Al Snow on both Velocity and Heat while also working dark matches. Clearly, WWE were at least interested, but they never made a move and Bobby made his way to TNA instead, where he became a star before eventually going to WWE. Number 2. The Brooklyn Brawler Ordinary jobbers are all well and good, but jobbers with gimmicks are much better. Steve Lombardi got to be both as he started working under his own name while wearing generic trunks and boots and doing little more than losing basic matches very easily. After a few years of that, he started developing a little bit of a heelish edge. He still lost all his matches, of course, but he was a regular presence on television and house shows. And then, in 1989, Lombardi transformed into the Brooklyn Brawler, a street tough in a disheveled New York Yankees jersey and jeans. Now competing under the watchful guidance of Bobby Heenan, Brawler entered into a feud with the Red Rooster. And then he lost all of those matches too, as his alliance with the brain was quietly phased out and he went back to his role as an enhancement talent. And that is where he remained for the rest of his in-ring career, though he at least stood out thanks to the name and gimmick and had occasional flashes of greatness, such as when he got a victory over Triple H in 2000 and made Jinder Mahal tap out at TLC 2012. When you think of the name Brooklyn Brawler, you may not think star, but you damn well know who he is. Number 1. The Hardy Boys the Hardy Boys were not quite Hardy men and more like Hardy babies when they showed up full of spunk, as the kids say, as enhancement talents in the mid-90s. Eager to please and willing to bump their backsides off, Matt and Jeff were favourites of superstars who knew that they would look good throwing the North Carolinians around with glee. Amazingly, Jeff was underage and actually lied about how old he was to WWE management in order to get his break. Looking like a Vanilla Ice tribute act, the charismatic Enigma got beaten by Razor Ramon, 1-2-3 Kid, Jim Neidhart, King Kong Bundy, Waylon Mercy, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Hakushi, Owen Hart, and, well, just about everyone in those first few years. Brother Matt, on the other hand, had the pleasure of getting his backside kicked by IRS, The Undertaker, Crush, Nikolai Volkov, Steve Austin, The Sultan, and, well, just about everyone else too. It was when they were finally allowed to team and had more seasoning that WWE realised that they had something special, signing them properly to developmental deals before reintroducing them during the Attitude Era. 